Well, in the good days of ancient Greece, there was a philosopher by the name of Aristippus, and he decided to make a trip to another island and took a boat. He didn't know that the boat was run by pirates. And of course, in those days, when you traveled, you took your money with you. You didn't have any traveler's checks. <laughs> you didn't have any negotiable securities or anything in that nature. So you took the cost of your trip right along in a little box among your baggage. While well, Aristippus was sitting quietly in his cabin, he heard some talking going on on the deck outside in which the captain of the pirate ship and the crew were preparing to dump him overboard and take the money. Well, it kind of perturbed him for a moment, but he realized there must be some solution. So the next morning when the sun came up, Aristippus was sitting out on the bowsprit of the boat with his feet dangling on each side, holding in his hands his cash box, and he was dropping the coins one by one into the ocean. And the pirate said, What are you doing that for? And Aristippus said very quietly, "'Tis better that the gold should perish for Aristippus than that Aristippus should perish for the gold." <laughs> and as a result of this rather clever move, why, uh, he was landed safely at his proper destination, but the trip was rather more expensive than he had expected. <laughs> This morning we want to talk a little bit about the problem of money. In the first place, I don't think we should always condemn wealth as responsible for our financial difficulties. It is not wealth, it is man's relationship with it. It's what he does with it and how he gets it. The motives behind it and the motives that he starts into motion with it. The material itself is either paper, silver, gold, or copper. It has no moral problem of its own. It came from the earth and ultimately will return to it again. The whole problem is the matter of use and abuse. And it looks as though at the moment we are having what might be termed an economic dope problem. It looks as though money has suddenly become one of the most dangerous drugs with which the human being must contend. The situation is very close in its parallels. The individual takes the drug to feel high. The individual accumulates money to feel high, to feel superior, to fulfill ambition, and to gain some kind of economic advantage over other people. Now these motives are not the highest nor the purest and have resulted in thousands of years of tragedy. It was long known and still believed that you cannot trade any longer on a merchandise basis. You cannot swap a cow for two sheep or something of this nature. You cannot carry your collateral uh, to the market with you. There has to be a medium of exchange. A medium of exchange is something by which there is a regulation of a transaction by means of which objects of physical and actual value are represented by an exchange medium and the prices and the profits are judged by the possessors of the medium. Now we know that in old times wealth was very important but not nearly so as now. Actually, nearly every ancient thinker realized that uh, wealth was a substitute for internal maturity. The individual gained wealth to gain power. When he should have been trying to get whatever superiority he deserved through the advancement of his intellect, through the improvement of his character, and through the redemption of his various aptitudes and attitudes. Therefore, instead of growing, the individual seeks through power a possession. If he has enough of the medium, he is available to all types of opportunities. He has the privilege of enslaving others. He has the privilege of controlling the few financial destinies of nations. But the whole thing is a great big financial 
tempest in a teapot. There is no rich person alive today, of any consequence certainly, who doesn't know that his days are numbered. He is perfectly aware of the fact that he cannot take any of this with him. He can also well often realize that in the accumulation of it, the only part of him that does survive physically, his reputation, is defiled. There is no one who really respects him, no one admires him, men fear him, and are often jealous of his possessions and attempt to rob him of them. Buddha was very clear on discussing this particular subject. He said the great poverty, problem of poverty is that men sigh because they are not rich. The great problem of wealth is men sigh for fear their wealth will be taken from them. And most of these ends are actually experienced in daily existence. The problem, therefore, of the medium of exchange becomes very interesting and in, in many cases very complicated. We know that coinage was comparatively recent, two or three thousand years, but the exchange problem went way back to the dawn of time. And most of our financial structure is based upon exchange processes. In other words, we're using money to accomplish that which we did without money at a previous time. The medium has now become all important in itself. And because of this, it has become a dismal failure upon the face of nature. The individual comes into this world with certain potentials. He is certainly more than merely a money grabber when he is born. He is not concerned in infancy with cash. He is rather concerned with the fulfillment of immediate needs and a constant need for love and attention. The individual, therefore, as he grows up in life, must accept and take on the, the economic situation of the world and generation in which he lives. But the person himself has potentials, and nature's intention is that man should live to grow, that he should become more, that he should understand better, that he should enrich life, and that he should cooperate with all other living things in the perpetuation of a just economy. This was uh, a great problem. Some of the bo uh, boys and girls of the last generation tried to solve it by various types of socialism. They also tried single tax. We went through a series of experiences with the mugwumps and many others. We went into pressures with the Bellamy's looking backwards and all the utopians who have gone before. But out of all of this, nothing really satisfactory has emerged. Today, two great nations, China and the Soviet Union, are attempting to solve the economic problem by removing the incentive of wealth. Well, it's not been successful for the simple reason that without the incentive, nobody wanted to do anything. It became a matter of forcing the government or the nation to make a kind of slavery out of the population so that it would pay its own bills. This all came to a very sad showdown here in the Great Depressions through which we have passed in the present century. The actual answer, therefore, is to realize that the trouble lies not in the medium of exchange, nor in the theory of exchange. The problem lies in the abuse of the medium of exchange. And this abuse has increased constantly until wealth has become the final incentive for the majority of human beings. Wealth may be in money, it might be in cattle, it may be in beads or wampum, but something that is generally valued has become the goal of our modern thinking and living. We do have idealists, we do have mystics, we do have philosophers, but for the most part people are concerned primarily with the accumulation of material goods, and this accumulation necessitates an economic system which will provide them with the means to buy and sell. 
This economic system, of course, becomes more aggravated as time goes on. Little by little, it has resulted in what might be termed an age of increasing luxury. The idea now is that success is luxury. Success is to reach that point in life where you do not need to work. Therefore, successful people have a very bad time afterwards because not needing to do anything, they fail to develop any potential within themselves except the privilege of spending, which soon becomes a burden upon the spirit. Now, uh, the old the ancients had these uh, schools of initiation. They had mysteries. They had systems of ritualism. And they had strange and wonderful pageantries to emphasize the workings of the divine will. All of these mysteries and pageantries consisted of various forms of temptation which had to be resisted. The individual had to be tempted to compromise his character in order to gain some insignificant or unreasonable reward. If he gave in to this temptation, he failed the test and was therefore no longer eligible for advancement on the level of human culture. So we have always some kind of initiation. In primitive times, these were physically painful. The individual often had to suffer from wounds and from various physical ailments brought on by the testing of character. Later, these wounds were no longer used, but various tests of attitudes became dominant. The individual seeking enlightenment had to prove that enlightenment came first. He had to prove the willingness to sacrifice most of the great advantages of wealth and luxury in order to improve his inner life. So today we have a great system of wealth which is not key to improvement. The individual and the community, the world in fact, in taking this test, the test of wealth, is failing the examination. Instead of having the courage to rise above the temptations of temporary gain, he takes the attitude, largely, that he wants what he wants as quickly as he can get it because he does not know, long, know how long he will be here. Now, looking over the simple situation as it is, we wonder that people have ever been willing to take the attitudes that are now dominant. The individual, no matter how high his salary, no matter how many dividends he has, no matter how many homes and castles and chateaus he may purchase, is a fallible creature. He is a being that has a very temporal existence, subject to innumerable infirmities and inevitably resulting in the final termination of material existence. Therefore, this entire process, which dominates the lives of probably 90% of human beings, is a process that is little better than a tempest in a teapot. The individual cannot take it with him, yet he is willing to commit crimes against humanity in order to get it. He is always fighting some way to protect it, but another criminal is waiting to take it from him. All of these processes are surrounded by one inevitable fact, that nature, the universe, the great plan of things, is simply indifferent to the whole subject. It is meaningless in terms of ultimates. It is meaningless in terms of anything and everything except a small life within this little atmosphere which we call uh, mortality. Materialism is probably largely responsible for the spread of the wealth mania. Materialism, by denying the individual any spiritual overtones, denying him any hope of immortality, denying him any moral incentives for self-discipline or self-control, leads the average person into the problem of immediate satisfaction. He wants to have what he has while he can use it. But nearly all those who do this do not live to use it. They spend a little, lose a little, give a little, and have a lot taken from them. But the actual termination of the situation is not fortunate. 
And in being unfortunate, it grows, increases, and distributes itself throughout the world, resulting in war, crime, desolation, starvation, and a mass of infirmities, all of which, to one way or another, are related to the desire for personal gain, regardless of consequence. So we have here a, the whole world situation suspended from one essential point, and that essential point is superiority of the person himself. He wishes to be superior, and he feels that the only way to become superior is to gain wealth. All his education is toward wealth. All his attitudes in life are towards those public services which are well paid. Almost everything that he does is termed in the matters of his economic capacity. The more he has to spend, the more luxury and the more fulfillment of material desires. But these desires themselves are meaningless in the large pattern of things. The individual has all these advantages and still, when the time comes, passes on in a completely miserable state. I have had the privilege, or sorrow in fact, of being present at the deathbeds of a number of wealthy people. At the last moment there is this desperate search for consolation. And on his deathbed, the average millionaire would give it all for one more day of life. But he hadn't got it. And also I've seen been with materialists who at the last moment of life, in tears, begged me to assure them that there was something beyond death. There has to be something. And they had been educated out of the belief in the continuity of life. Why was this education? thus stumped and, and prevented why was the individual allowed to grow up as a materialist he was allowed to grow up as a materialist because he in that way helped to perpetuate the delusion of wealth if he had ideals that were stronger than the possession of wealth he would be considered an idealist and as an idealist completely impractical and destined and foreordained to poverty for the rest of his life and yet, at the side by side in the graveyard, who can tell them apart? The idealist or the materialist? Both lie down together. And the only important thing is which one dies, lies down with the best hope. Without this, the whole problem is, is a deadly failure. Now, nature has set this pattern the way it is for a very good reason. The individual has to prove the power within himself to control himself. He has to prove that the great evolutionary scheme to which he belongs, which is attempting to make something out of him, is succeeding. If the individual succeeds in living throughout his life with no improvement of character, no solution of temperamental uh, delinquencies, no actual <laughs> wisdom or thoughtfulness, very little kindness and not much real or sincere affection, in this condition, the individual does not grow, and he therefore passes out of this life very much the way he came in. He was a failure when he was born. He did not use anything that has been given to him to make life better or stronger. At the present moment in various parts of the world, materialistic social cultures are beginning to look at this matter a little differently. They are gradually realizing that materialism is a dead end. They do not have any more capacity to prove materialistic hypotheses than the idealistic ones. The dreamer has just as much evidence as the person suffering from the delusion of wealth. There is no way of proving that the material life of the individual can be made secure by any means other than the growth of character. He must become more in himself. To become more is to grow. To assemble or accumulate more is a very serious doubt as to whether he will grow or not. Now, if a person has wealth, either self-earned or by heredity, 
or by the dispositions of circumstances or the Los Angeles lottery, if he has wealth, then the problem comes, what is he going to do with it? He lives in a world of people, most of whom are suffering. He is living today in a world under tyrannies uh, that have bring tr brought tragedy to millions. He has now a power, a power of wealth. What is he going to do with it? Is he simply going off someplace and gamble it at Las Vegas? Is he going to buy another yacht? Is he going to do all these extravagant things and throw them in the faces of people who have nothing? This was the beginning of the French Revolution. This has been the cause of the overturning of systems. Nearly every major revolution of history was based upon an economic exploitation. The failure of that which has to help that which has not. This constitutes a problem for the distribution of wealth. As I mentioned before, Andrew Carnegie once said, that it was right to live rich, but man should die poor. Before he comes to the end, all that he has should be made available to all who need. This problem of passing these vast fortunes on to persons who never earned them uh, presents another problem. If the recipient who has never earned it wishes to become internally enlightened and dedicate his life to usefulness, he can take the accumulated wealth and use it for the benefit of all mankind. But if he has given, been given no incentives, if education has done nothing to enrich his character, if he continues to make his own appetite the final source of all demand, then the wealth problem goes on in cycles of misery until the whole system breaks down. So we look at for the moment on the fact of the matter. We have 70, 80, 90, maybe 100 years here. During this time, we are here for some kind of serious business. Now, serious business does not need to be a tragedy. Serious business does not mean that we must go from one misery to another. But it does mean that being here, we are in the presence of a great unfinished situation. We come into the world which is in itself in a midmost condition, somewhere between its own beginnings and its ultimates. We are here, therefore, as part of an ever-moving panorama of social change. We are here to become part of something that is trying to outgrow its own mistakes. We are not here long before we begin to realize what some of these mistakes are. We begin to realize that it is necessary either to overlook the suffering of others or else to make changes in our own disposition. The easy thing to do, of course, is to simply overlook the miseries of other people. But nature, again, is a little bit strict in this issue. If we do this long enough, we have social revolution. Because the underprivileged must have an opportunity in China at the present time, the government is lifting restraint on private industry and private business, is permitting people to earn something themselves. Now, this is probably a proper and natural thing. We should each of us earn what we have and what we need. We should not be a part of a socialized structure which bestows all necessities and leaves us no incentives to the development of higher resources. We cannot be made secure by being supported by the state. The support that we get is that which is given us to do something else with. Wherever life is supported, it is assumed that that life will reward this support by growth, by development, and by usefulness. If it does not accomplish these things, then we ultimately end in economic collapse. So we're now faced with the definite personal issue of saying, let us accept that for the moment we are going to be functioning under an economic system. That this economic system used can be of use to all of us. Abuse can be the wreck of nations. Abuse is where selfishness takes over and dominates methodologies. 
The individual who is selfish is always in trouble. His selfishness never really brings him the consolation or the accumulation which he desires. If he gets that which he has not earned, it will slip through his fingers and disappear. We see that today in the vast aggravations in the financial level of life. With persons of comparatively slight abilities, by means of publicity and press agents, making millions of dollars a year. What are they doing with the millions? A few are known to be doing good things with some of it at least, but for the most part it slips away. And today a large part of the wealth that is accumulated by lack of real in integrity or understanding is being spent to buy narcotics. The vicious circle goes right on. And in this vicious circle the two walls of birth and death still border the whole transaction, leaving us very little uh, to be proud of as we go along. Now we can't necessarily uh, try to live other people's lives. We can't may lead a parade to do a certain thing. Under some conditions reforms are achieved and then they are achieved, it is a wonderful thing. But a very large number of those most needing reforms reject them utterly. So we have another way in which we have to approach this thing. And that is we have to begin all this reformation process by enlarging and de deepening our own understanding. The only person whom we can lead successfully through this labyrinth is ourselves. We may be able to influence and inspire others, but the whole test of material civilization rests with each person who lives in this world. Each individual on every level of life is confronted today with decisions, things he must decide in himself, attitudes that he must take, uh, solutions that he must find and if found apply. As a result of that, no matter what position the individual may be in, whether he is in a dominated society in which he has really nothing to say, whether he is a free soul with everything to say, we, it is not important. The important thing is that each person must in his own way discover the reason for himself. He must dis discover the real meaning of wealth. He must know what money is intended for and how to use it properly. And he must realize that improper use becomes private and collective tragedy. He must take his various ambitions concerning his own economic future and subject these ambitions to the tests of integrity. If he wishes to be more than he is, is he willing to earn this improvement? If he wishes to become stronger in his determinations to keep the rules of life, he must strengthen his determination. In every way, the, the answer to the problem for the individual is not that he shall go off by himself and worry about the common good. The thing for him to do is to carefully note his own relationships with life and make sure that in this river that he is flowing down at the present time, he is learning what he is supposed to learn on the trip. We are here for a certain knowledge. We must, to fulfill natural law, leave this life at the end of a material incarnation, better persons than we were when we came. If we were uncertain in childhood, we must be more certain in maturity and most certain in the elderly years. If we are idealists, we must believe ideals when we're young, we must apply them when we're old. Idealism is a way of life that is friendly, a way of life in which we live together in fraternity, a fraternity that is destroyed by ambition and very largely frustrated by wealth. So we must go about these matters in a new and more reasonable and intelligent manner. Everything that, have, that comes to us is an opportunity and a responsibility. Every person we know brings us something and asks something. This is inevitable, and very often we are glad to find the people who bring, but very reluctant to know the people who ask. Everything is not reciprocity. 
It is to get what we can and the other person do the best he can. All these attitudes are the, the destruction of a world order. Now, in uh, times back in Egypt or China or India, the world order was rather sketchy. Uh, very little of the world was known. Opportunities for wastefulness were comparatively limited. The various powerful political pressures towards materialism were not supported or sustained. While wealth did exist in antiquity, wealth was not regarded as a particular ornament because the wealth structure was overshadowed by the great mystery institutions. Every great civilization of the past has had a dominant religion which really did influence the followers. A religion to which every decent person gave allegiance. A religion in which the right of divinity to control humanity was unquestioned. And a system also in which all good was done in the name of eternal good. And the more good we did, the more immediate the environment improved. All these things were part of the Greek way of life, the Egyptian way, the Persian, the Hindu, the Buddhist, all these different nations had ethics, great systems of traditional integrities which were supposed to dominate human conduct. Every religion in the world that has had troubles has had trouble as a result of departing from the original revelation. Wealth and power and ambition gradually took over and destroyed the supremacy of the spiritual revelation upon which a civilization had been based. Instead of therefore perpetuating the good, we used the good as a means of enslaving something, to dominate, to control, to take over, to press our own opinions upon others even though we couldn't live them ourselves. So a nature, being what it is, has various discipline systems for creatures of differing degrees of evolution. There is one type of dis discipline for a rabbit and another type of discipline for a human being. And yet everything that lives is living in hazard and requires discipline to survive. There are laws for every creature, and any creature that breaks the laws is subject to self-destruction. Even the animal kingdoms have their internal integrations. They have a kind of mysterious intuition as to the needs of their own kind. And by observing each other, they gain the great education. In the animal kingdom, each type becomes learned by watching the works of that particular type in its daily existence. Whatever that type does that endangers it, the member must avoid. That which fulfills it, the, mess, the member must uh, cling to. All these things are part of natural law operating. And the moment an animal breaks natural law, it's lost. That is why my old friend Seton used to say oh so often, practically no animal ever dies of old age. It dies of the gradual failure of either its integrities or its vitalities. But never does it die a natural death. This is because of the way things are in life. Perhaps human beings do not die a natural death, see that. Perhaps much of the terror, pain, misery, suffering is due to the fact that we are not yet perfect, that we have not as yet developed the full measure of our humanity. Perhaps that very solution that will sometime result in the brotherhood of human beings will also result in a painless transition from one life to another. But we are here as we are with our limitations, with our hopes, with our fears. And in these levels of insights, we have to solve the daily problem of existence. So we must try to prepare some kind of a code which we can live with injury to none and benefit to as many as possible. Whatever we have, we must use as wisely as we can. Wise use guarantees a new and greater supply. 
whatever we have should never be wasted, thrown away, discarded, turned into something that is of no value to ourselves or anyone else. Take a good example of this, alcohol, narcotics, uh, cigarettes, all these things which waste money, destroy health, and endanger character in daily living. Out of these abuses arise a great deal of crime, and out of ambition for wealth, more crime, until the great crime organizations are very largely simply uh, dishonest accumulators of profits. So all these things have to come back to us, and we have to start thinking about them, or the end is not going to be what we hope it is. So we must begin in our own way. The individual should, as much as he can, strive to maintain a contact with his own inner life. He must try to listen to the higher aspirations that naturally come to him. If he has a feeling, an aspiration, he mustn't immediately kill it off because it's impractical. He must not base everything upon the laws of a system that has failed. Rather, he must base his convictions as far as he can upon a system which has never failed. And failure is a symbol of inadequacy of some kind. Failure is inevitable because we do not know any better. But failure decreases as integrity increases. And we can sometime, in the fullness of time, outgrow our own failures. We are here to outgrow weakness, outgrow selfishness, outgrow overambition, and outgrow the complete dominance of our lives by physical considerations. If we were going to stay here for a long time, maybe a thousand years or more, it might seem more reasonable to give a lot of attention to our physical existence. But with this short habit as we have, only a small part of time have we to live here. We must some way find out how we can use what we have to the advancement of a life that goes beyond our present embodiment. Now a lot of people don't believe in immortality. And this in term has been enhanced by a great deal of propaganda. In, in the belief in immortality, if it is generally accepted and applied, would interfere considerably with the accumulation of unreasonable profits in many enterprises. If the individual uh, has only now to do it, then he should do it all now. If he has only a few years to work before retirement, this becomes tremendously important. But somewhere behind all of this, as the wise have always realized, each of us has an eternal life, a life that goes on and on, far beyond the boundaries of any particular embodiment. Emerson was very strong and clear on these points, that there is an over-self that lives on, and that this over-self contains within it the records of all things done well, and also the resolution to correct the mistakes. Each person, therefore, can start in growing immediately if he wishes to look at his life, not necessarily simply philosophically, but in terms of plain old-fashioned common sense. If there is no future in something, why devote a life to it? If there is no justification for an attitude, why hold it tenaciously to the end of time? If the things we have we'll never be able to own, why make ownership such a tremendous factor? Why not admit that we are all here not to own but to share and that nothing that we have is more than a lease? We only have a lease on this physical body in which we live. And we certainly do not have total title to anything in our environment or any of our various achievements. The only thing that is eternal is locked within ourselves that life that gives life to other things. These other things fade away, but that life continues like the enduring rays of the sun. So we have to kind of think out how to get away from some of the miseries. Now, the moment you lower your ambitions to reasonable proportions, you get rid of a lot of worry. 
there's probably nothing at the present time that is doing more uh, to create various forms of psychosis than our pressures. The individual struggling with things he cannot control becomes mentally and emotionally ill. Yet ill as he is, he continues to fight desperately to keep on doing the things that made him ill. And his only outlet would be to stop doing it and then his whole house of cards would fall apart. So whatever he does or however he tries to get out of it, he is still in trouble. There is much more, more to be said about sanity than the mere fact of staying out of an institution. A psychological integration means that an individual has put his own mind in order. And uh, while we turn now largely to science for keys of orientation, we must realize that these keys, all of them originated in religion, and that the, the great healing power of life is integrity, and that this integrity means the doing of that which is most useful for all concerned. That which is good only for ourselves at the expense of others is a danger and a detriment. Therefore, if we really want to begin a better type of life, if we really want uh, to get out of these psychoses that are now burdening us, we have to begin to do a lot of things that uh, many of them hang on money. We have to find out, for example, how to handle the various problems of human association. Parental, parental association, husband and wife, parent and child, and self and the neighborhood. All these things have to be solved. And where any solution does not end in peace, there is no solution. The idea that we can solve a disinclination by avoiding it, if we can destroy us, uh, uh, get away from people we don't like by never speaking to them again. All these uh, foolish non-answers to anything. Wherever there is an animosity, it must be corrected. And whether or not the other person corrects it, we must. We must do, reach a point where no animosities, no antagonisms, no criticisms or condemnations are permitted in our inner lives. For these are all causes of mental and emotional sickness. The person we hate is, may never know we hate them, but the hatred in us will eat us up. We cannot afford these things, especially when life becomes more complicated and critical. Whatever attitude we have when we go to bed at night must be at peace with life. We must never take to bed at night an antagonism or an animosity. If we do, it will be intensified by the sleep process, and if we pre repeat it long enough and often enough, it will sicken the mind and make us incapable of reasonable thinking. Wherever we start out, we are looking for peace. Now, peace at any price is not what we're looking for, but we are looking at the fact that peace must be earned but that peace is an end, the only end to strife. That only the individual who within himself has found peace can survive the pressures of an unregenerate civilization. Only the person who can quietly estimate values, who is forever kind regardless of unkindness, is forever gentle in the face of cruelty, and is forever generous in the face of selfishness. Only this type of person is beginning to build those treasures where the thieves cannot come in and steal. We go on into that which lies beyond the present according to the way we have lived here. And we are not going to find that death changes any of our basic characteristics. If we were foolish in life, death will not make us wise. If we were selfish in life, death will not make us generous. If we were criminal in life, death will not make us virtuous. Death may present us with certain problems to help us again to continue the redemption of ourselves. But death is not the, pa the possibility of walking out on unfinished business. We take the unfinished business with us and in due time return with unfinished business to a world 
suffering from unfinished business. It goes on till it's solved, and the solution always begins with ourselves. Because in the large nature of everything, we go and we come, and those who are closest to us see us no more, and those we have never known may be close to us. But in all instances, in all conditions, it is the integrities that become the basis of enduring relationships. Those who are true friends are honorable. Those who have ulterior motives have never real friendship. Now, there's been talk about limiting the income of people so that no one can earn so much or more than a certain amount. This has an advantage in some ways if it can be enforced, but wherever it is enforced, there's going to be criminal interventions. There are going to be ways found to break the rule. If a man is told that he can only earn $25,000 a year, he will hire a specialist, two lawyers, and a crooked judge to make sure that he can have more. We cannot stop him by legal means. We can stop him only by integrities. We cannot prevent the individual from being selfish simply by putting him in jail. We cannot cause him to be no longer a criminal by imprisoning him or condemning him. We may be able to get him out of the way of society, but in doing this, society has not solved a problem. It has only punished a person. The great problem is not how to punish a criminal, but why it is necessary to have this type of situation in our cultural life. It's interesting to note that uh, two civilizations that we know about had no medium of exchange. One was the Mayas of Central America, and the other was the Incas of Peru. They were both reasonably advanced cultures, strong in arts and sciences, with, with good medical skills, with considerable understanding of astronomy, mathematics, music, and all these things, but without a medium of exchange. They didn't, as a result of not having a medium of exchange, when Pizarro asked the Inca of Peru what they did with criminals, the Inca looked at him kind of sadly for me and said, I really don't know. We don't have any. <laughs> the removal of the medium of exchange, or the absence of it, reduced a great deal of pressure, reduced most of the jealousies, the conspiracies, the cartels, the monopolies, and the private feuds, most of which had something to do with gain or loss. And with, the law, with gain or loss no longer considered as ne needed or practical, a whole uh, area of private sin, crime, and mistake was cleared up altogether. Because all these things ultimately, if not immediately, drift into these major errors of civilization. What I think we should learn more than anything else is to change abuse to use. The world is full of things that need to be done. The world is in great need of working together as a collective structure to make sure that we have food for unborn generations, that all possibilities of war are lost. Because war is always a gain, it is some structure of ambitions in which millions of the helpless die to maintain the arrogance of a few. The moment we really begin to think about humanity, there's lots of things we can do with money to help everything that needs helping, the reforming of education, the development of a new way of life in which honor is accorded to those who have given the most to the common good where every individual is proud of what he is doing and maybe restores the old guild system, in which the individual who became a first-class carpenter was just as good in the eyes of society as a first-class theologian or a doctor, for each was a master of his own craft. He had earned the respect of his fellow members, he was honored by them, and was considered to be a person of sufficient importance to be able to hold up his head before kings and dukes. If we achieve something, 
we do not have to depend upon money for reputation or for recognition. Many of the great achievements of history have been made by the poor. But the poor who have physically little have sometimes given us an immortal value to be carried forward into future ages. So here we are with nations that can't read and write, with uh, many health problems still unsolved, with congestion on the freeways, with our jails overflowing, with practically every public resource exploited. We have things to do. Here and there, I have noticed little accomplishments. Some town that was tired of being exploited by itself rose against the problem and solved it. They solved it with just plain thoughtfulness. Solved it by being kind instead of critical. Solved it by talking creatively rather than gossiping. And little by little, the control of ourselves makes us into people who are capable of contributing to essential progress. Then if we have little, we use it wisely. And the dollar from the man who has only a dollar is just as great as a million from another person. It is what we give, what we have, what we do that we should be proud of. What we are contributing to the advancement and the good of all that lives. There is no longer any time for all sectarianism, all the competition and struggles of creeds, all the fightings of beliefs, all the definite determination to convert somebody else to our opinions. These things are no longer necessary, they never were, and most of these problems have their roots in an economic situation. Money is at the root of most of the corruptions in philosophy, education, and theology just as much as in business. So we have a big problem, the big dope problem. We are doping ourselves to death with dollars. Uh, we find that uh, we are willing to pay a vast sum of money and commit crime to get the dollars for dope. We are doing the same thing on an economic level. We break every rule of human society to get the profit. And the profit makes us feel ten feet tall until the headache comes. Also, we find that uh, this process of dope or narcotics is undermining our interest in doing anything better. Little by little, we live only to have more of these great moments in which we think we are giants and wake up with a headache the next day. The, the wealthy have the same headaches and have the same problems. And, strangely enough, many of them are now making a partnership with the narcotics and the wealth is going in that direction. Everything is in a turmoil. And uh, I don't want to leave at all the impression of being fatalistic about this. I'm not. I think the answer is so glorious that it's almost impossible to imagine its possibilities. And that is, it's so wonderful to realize that these mistakes cannot go on forever. And that out of all these mistakes and all this suffering is going to come the great solution we've all been seeking. We will never get better until we can no longer be comfortable and remain worse. We will never solve problems until the problems annoy us beyond control. Here we have the great problem of wealth. It is the problem of our race that was brought with us in our own subconscious. The gods did not give it to us. The gods gave us only nature, and we have set up various real estate transactions involving it. But the main facts remain exactly the same. We are now getting to the point where all our shams are falling apart. We are getting to the point where we don't believe each other or trust each other in many instances. We are t disillusioned with entertainment, we are disillusioned with literature, we are afraid of science, and we know that we are bankrupt for the most part so far as philosophy is concerned. The modern generation has very little to offer. Therefore, all these things are becoming so uncomfortable that we can no longer endure them. We do not want to sit down every evening to some miserable television production that offends us before we are halfway through it. We do not want to be exploited every time we go to a store. We do not want to pay twice for everything we buy. We don't, we don't want to be subject to all kinds of exploitation. We don't wish to see the inflation going the way it is. 
all has to do with money. And it all has to do with what the rich man has said, namely that whatever we charge, somebody will buy it. And he's probably quite true. We will buy anything, even if it costs the last dime we have. But the things that we cannot buy are the things we need the most. We need the, the integrity to prevent us from buying what we don't need. We are a little bit like the Thoreau in Walden. We are really simple creatures. We wish security. We wish tr uh, education for our children. We wish a constructive career and good workmanship. These things are available to all if we will stop all kinds of misrepresentations and the singing of songs that have no rhythm. We've got to get out of this idea that these things can go on forever and that nothing lies ahead but more of the same. Now we are beginning to realize something else that is interesting. There is a gradual rising of organized resistance to corruption. There is a gradual arising, an organized determination not to support that which we do not believe. It is showing here and there. Books are coming on it. People are talking about it. Religious groups are emphasizing it. Even politicians occasionally refer to it uh, with a hesitant note. But all the way along, there is a feeling that a universal reformation is at hand. Now, if this is true, if we're really beginning to feel that the time has come for a major change, <coughs> what is the cause of this new feeling? The answer is money. It's not the money we're going to make off of it, but the money situation we can't stand as it is. We start gradually realizing that we are being constantly exploited by each other for profit alone. And it's gradually coming to our attention that we're getting a little tired of it. We are no longer willing simply to go to be the spenders for somebody else's advantage. We are watching the bargains. We are watching the money markets go up and down. The thing is getting more ridiculous every day. And we are gradually awaking to the situation that we are the slaves of a monetary system that we are the slaves of individuals who corrupt that system to their own advantage. That money as a medium of exchange is no longer even permitted. It has something on it all the way along in the form of ulterior motive. Every transaction is geared not to use but to profit. Every accumulation has been to some degree at the expense of others. Now, we don't mean that all of this is bad or that we should be blamed for it. It isn't that. But we are gradually reaching the point where we should outgrow it, where we might be perfectly willing to believe our ancestors couldn't do any better. There is no reason why we can't do a little better as we go along. We have more advantages. We have more understanding. We have more knowledge than any other generation, and uh, we're in the worst condition of them all. This cannot continue and doesn't need to. And the answer to that is the recognition that wealth can no longer be the guiding, driving force behind civilization. It may be there. We need it. We don't have any desire today to carry the little pig to market any more than we did 2,500 years ago. Wealth is a medium of use. Wealth, wealth is a good servant, but a terrible master. The, it is here to be used to make life more convenient and not to be corrupted. It is, it is the little group sitting under the buttonwood tree in lower North Manhattan that is held to be responsible for the miseries of mankind. This is not actually true. The real truth of the matter is we have allowed money to become a thing in itself, a value just simply as money, and that the man is rich who can clip a coupon, coupon. This is not true. All of these things are simply little emotional tingles in our subconscious. The mere fact that we have these things may be protective of our needs, but the moment we begin to overlook everything else in the cause of them, we're in trouble. 
money is no use unless we know what to do with it and how to use it most advantage and most advantageously for the good of all we know and all that are concerned. General world financial situations are rather beyond the average private citizen's comprehensions at the moment. But the fact remains that our world is a mass of wastefulness, that everything is trying to make something more out of someone else, and all authority is working back and forth, living off of the ignorance of the majority. Now this you just can't have. And the wealth should be the thing to break it up. We should be using money to liberate people from the delusion of money. We should be using it to educate them in the values that they must carry with them, not only through this life, but beyond. When we send a child to college, we should not be thinking, shall we send him and make him a doctor, a lawyer, or uh, some of these learned professions, because they pay better. We should give him the education that will enable him to develop himself, his own internal hopes, his aspirations, his convictions. He should be given a chance to release something, for the growth of a people comes through the release of the internal potential of the citizens. Every member of a human society has something to give, but for the most part the rest of that society doesn't want it. It wants only that part which will enable these societies to exploit each other till the end of time. But actually, money should be used to make certain that the better things of life are made available to those who are willing to earn them, and that all individuals should be given sufficient education to assist him in determining the difference between right and wrong. There's no reason why we should graduate from our greater university today persons who do not know whether they're good or bad and for the most part don't care. So we've got to move it from an economic foundation to an ethical foundation. And the ethical use of money would be a tremendous help. It would be the same thing as the ethical use of medicine. The medical sciences and arts are great help if they're not exploited. We can find great and wonderful things in all the discoveries we have made, but we must from within ourselves develop that power which can coordinate these various discoveries and dedicate them to the service of the human need. We must do that which is necessary to protect and advance the reason for our own existence. We are a world that is becoming more populous all the time and a world in which the threats of, of destruction are increasing daily. These things have to be faced. Money is not going to pay for them. Money will not pay for peace. It will pay for armament, armament to make sure that there is war. Money will not pay for health, but it may, under proper usage, assist in the development of knowledge that will help. Money used properly can advance every form of knowledge that man is concerned with and solve most of the so social problems of society. It can answer many problems of family disputes and discords. It can affect the relation of parent and child. It can affect everything constructively. But it must be a, a knowledge which teaches us how to use constructively the tools of our human race. We must find ways of doing the things that need the doing. And whether these bring great profit or no profit, that which profits humanity is far more important than the profit that goes into the bank. So we have this problem of wealth, not as a, as a menace really, but as a challenge. The individual who can outgrow the control of what he has and become dedicated to what he is, will do a great deal for himself and others. We could be a much happier people if all of our outside addictions were controlled by our inside convictions. And if we do not have enough convictions to prove this, then we are not educated and facilities should be available to make certain that we gain the proper schooling. No one should graduate from school 
who doesn't know the difference uh, between integrity and profit, who doesn't know the difference between cooperation and competition. And no one should graduate from anything who does not realize that competition is the death of trade. All these things have to work together. We're on one little planet, kind of floating around on a cosmic mothball somewhere in space. We have been here for some time, and we'd like to remain a little longer. But to do this thing, we've got to realize that we're castaways in space. And while someday we may wander around on Uranus, we may not find it very habitable. We are here to learn to get along with each other and become what we have never been able to be as yet, and that is one happy family. A family in which everybody is equally interested in the good of everybody that everyone is hoping the best for everybody, that we are all delighted at the success of other people, if it is right, if we are doing things well, and if we find someone with a great idea that we can get behind them and help them. There is no reason why we should finance every scheme there is and, and be hesitant to the bitter end uh, to advance or finance anything that is contrib contributing to the public good. Everything is in terms of how much. And now we need to know how much is there that we can possibly do and learn. The inside of the human nature is a very subtle thing. Somewhere locked inside of ourselves is a mechanism superior to anything that man can ever invent. Uh, some people think that we have the only living computer. But actually, the computer is an invention of one faculty of the mind and is going to go bad ultimately simply because it is invented for profit rather than for use. Wherever the use is a sort of slogan and the individual invents only for the advancement of wealth, the, uh, the answer is not there. But there is in someone, in everyone, a, a center of consciousness that is a, more or less a cosmic computer, if you want to say so, is something in there that knows more than the human being as a person is likely to know for a long time. There is a spark of that eternal divinity, that nameless life and light, which is in every creature that comes into the world. This something which is the great morality, the great integrity, a tremendous force, a law without words, a law that is supported only by its own righteousness. In each person there is a potential. There is art, there is music, there is literature. We are all endowed with internal resources more, volume, more valuable than anything that we can attain through schooling. Now the purpose of education, as understood to the ancients, was the re release and uh, strengthening of these inner resol resolutions. We were supposed to use the word educo for education to its Latin and Greek meaning, educo, to draw forth, to bring forth, to make known. Whereas today education is to cram in and prevent the individual from doing any thinking for himself at all. We wish to impose upon each child the fallacy from which we are suffering. We want them to make identically the same mistakes that we do. And we take the quiet thought that nobility will be gone by the time our descendants decide how, how wrong we were and also are in the same spot themselves. Now this isn't because everybody intends to be dishonest. It's just short-sightedness and a lot and loss of values. When religion was important in the world, we had a lot of despotism, but we also had a vast storehouse of integrity that is lost to us. Religion was something that put a divine power above our human purposes. Religion thought in terms of a divine purpose, a divine reason for things, beyond our common mistakes and misinstructions. And that some way through prophets, sages, revelations, mysticism, and so forth, this divine plan could be communicated to humanity and that the gods of all ages have spoken through their sages and saviors for the instruction and improvement of humanity. We have received from all of them 
golden rules, commandments, commandments, and all kinds of admonitions as to how they should live as persons, how each individual should cultivate a certain conviction within himself which would make him worthy to be considered a, a religious person or be dedicated to the universal purpose for things. All these inner in, uh, impulses are being sm slowly smothered out. We don't give any chance anymore for the individual to be himself. We impose upon him by intention, we mean the best in the world, only that which will give him physical security. And yet every day we see this physical security fade, getting worse and less obvious and failing before us because of the intemperances of our own natures. Therefore, there has to be something better. All things physical are the instruments of that which is transphysical. Everything that is commonly used is an instrument for a secret purpose. Our eyes are not to just see things with or to watch television with. Our eyes are to help us understand life to understand nature. They give us the faculty of power of feeding all kinds of secret inner impulses, desires, and appetites that are of themselves noble. Our ears are to hear good things and not the noise of rock music. Our various faculties and sensory perceptions open to us worlds far beyond our understanding. We can share in the wisdom of all time we can accept the virtues of the past. We can grow with everything that has ever grown unless we stunt ourselves by means of a type of living which, which shuts out everything that isn't investable at 9%. We must to get out of this idea that all success is in terms of profit. If, what does it profit a man? if he gains the whole earth and loses his own soul. People just don't think it's nicer, just don't, no, don't quote that anymore because it is embarrassing. <laughs> but there is a tremendous truth and a lot of people need to be embarrassed. But they won't accept it. They will never do it that way. But in some ways, through the pressure of circumstances, through the breaking down of a system that has already failed, we may come closer to the recognition of that system which is bound to succeed. That out of all of this problem, the problem of our humanity is more or less at stake. We are human. Humanity means, in a projection of the word, a humane treatment. It means fellowship, kindness, cooperation, generosity of spirit, gentleness of life. As humans, we are not supposed to still suffer from the wars of the jungle, which we are assumed to have left behind. We are no longer part of that which lives by killing, or by destroying, or fighting for territory. All these things belong to a form of life theoretically, that we have outgrown. Therefore, as human beings, it is our natural state to get along together peacefully and in a friendly way. We are simply human, and the basis of our humility and humanity is cooperation. We are the first creature that we know that has become aware of the fact that we can live together in peace. We are only creature that has put goals above food and reproduction. We are the only creatures that have lifted their eyes to something superior and realized that in some strange way we are kindreds of the angels. We know better. We sense that we have been given something which we are supposed to use wisely and lovingly and skillfully. And if we can understand that, then all the things that we come to, all the min minerals in the earth, all the plants and f in the ground, all the various forces of nature around us are there to help us. They are part of an environment 
but it is not the forces that of the environment that mold us but it is our own part that molds them if the forests do not change us primarily but we can destroy the forests forever we are also to be benefited if the forests remain and in taking care of us the forests also take care of other, hundreds of other living things therefore protection love and understanding all these advance purpose greed destroys that which is selfish destroys itself to the end of time therefore it is time for thoughtful people to give it further consideration we are here because we firmly and gently believe that we are trying to find a better way of life we are searching for those truths that survive the decays of nations we are searching for a way of harmlessness with mercy for all charity for all and malice toward none this type of thinking is very essential to those who intend to try and be better people because with all our efforts to be truly spiritual to be truly wise to be truly practical humanitarians there still is this nagging within ourselves of the damage that wrong training has already done where it has damaged we must recognize the damage and correct it if we have been brought up incorrectly then we must rise above the mistakes of the past whether of this generation or former generations and live into the virtues of the future these are the things that we must really do and if we do them we will find that every medium that we have is no longer something evil that we have to fight it is something beautiful that we have to use and which we have deformed by our own selfishness all natural resources are good the deforming is done by the negative thoughts of human beings so we don't want those anymore if we can help it we want all our resources to be used for the good of us all and in so doing to accomplish the end which creation intended and uh, which creation is strong enough to attain regardless of our opinions therefore wealth is first of all inner wealth of understanding giving us the wisdom and the skill to use our outward possessions according to the laws of creation and distribution and redemption these things being true we'll get along all right